Here's a spiritual truth. When you're living in the moment, there's nothing to seek. There's nothing to be. There's nothing to obtain or grab or know. But living in the moment, all the good of God is right there at the point of view. Do you believe this? And we always live there, right? That's where we always live in the moment. It's where our chaplains like to live. I have chaplains holding sacred space. This is Sharon and Judy's over there, and they're holding the unbroken awareness of the presence of God in, through, around, and expressed as each and every one of you as you find that moment. So dump into the stream that they are creating with you and for you. You know what I find? The people on the planet, the older I get, the more I'm able to live in the moment. My grandparents could live in the moment way better than my parents, and my parents could do it better than me. Isn't it that maybe we mature as we grow in body and mind and heart, we also grow spiritually? Maybe? Amen. <laughs> Spoken like the 82-year-old who's going on 14. <laughs> so I thought I would start a little bit today with a letter from a grandparent of wisdom about living in the moment. And she writes to her family, the other day, I went up to a local Christian bookstore, and I saw a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. I was feeling particularly sassy that day, so I bought the sticker, and I put it on my car. She continues to write to her family. Today, I was sitting in my car at a red light at a busy intersection, lost in thought about the Lord, and I didn't notice that the light had changed. It's a good thing somebody else loves Jesus because if he hadn't honked, I never would have noticed. You know, I found that lots of people love Jesus. While I was sitting there, the guy behind started honking like crazy. He leaned out his window and he screamed, for the love of God. What an exuberant cheerleader he was for the Lord. Everyone started honking, and I just leaned out my window, and I started waving and smiling at all these beautiful Christian people. I even honked my horn a few times to share the love. I saw another guy waving in a funny way with only his middle finger stuck up in the air. And when I asked your grandfather what that meant, he told me it was the Hawaiian good luck sign. Well, I've never met anybody from Hawaii, so I simply leaned out the window and I gave him the Hawaiian good like sign back in return. Your grandfather burst out laughing. Even he was enjoying this religious experience. A couple of the people were so caught up in the moment and the joy of the moment that they got out of their cars and they started walking towards me. I bet they wanted to pray with me. Or maybe they wanted to know what church I attended. Oh, but that's when I noticed that the light had changed. So I joyously waved to all my sisters and brothers, and I drove on through the intersection. I noticed I was the only car that got through the intersection before the light changed again. And I felt kind of sad that I had to leave them after all the love that we had just shared. So I slowed the car down. I leaned out the window, and I gave them all the Hawaiian good luck sign one last time as I drove away. Praise the Lord for such wonderful people. I love that joke. And it, two different perspectives. You put yourself into the skin of the woman. She's in the moment. She's completely in the moment in the bliss, un, unaffected by what was going on. And then I want you to put yourself into the skin of the people honking behind her. Same sort of outer circumstances, but a whole different type of experience was going on. I'm asking you to put yourself into the skin of those people that were honking. I'm currently leading a class right now, and it's entitled Beyond Fight and Flight, dealing with difficult conversations with grace, with peace, and ease. In this week's class, we're going to address those inevitable moments, I'm sure we've all had them, where everything is peace, everything is wonderful, Every, the birds are singing, the rainbows are dotting the sky, and you feel so connected to all that is, and then all of a sudden, bam, like the Batman, bam, wham, boom, the volcano goes off. All hell breaks loose. Dum, 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 dum. And dumb being the operative word. Anybody ever go stupid in a moment? In a moment we go unconscious and we lose sight of all that we had just a moment ago because the circumstances changed. In a moment the volcano goes off and all those old feelings, that wound begins to emerge again. It comes to the surface. Something that we need to look at. The old thoughts and the old habits. 
and you go unconscious. Somebody says something. Anybody ever had this happen? Somebody said something that you didn't expect, and all of a sudden, ooh, your face starts to get red, your teeth start to clench, your heart starts to race. If you're a human being walking this earth, it's going to happen. We're in the world. We're having human experiences, and you end up in one form or another flashing the Hawaiian good luck sign. This is the moment that exposes if our spirituality is built upon rock, our spirituality is upon sand. You know, it feels good to come and to be in a sanctuary and to share spiritual ideas, but where does church happen? It's 24-7 out there. It's not in here, although I have seen moments in here where somebody said something and volcanoes went off. But the reality is it's 24-7, 365 days connected to the power on a rock that does not move, that is absolute in its nature. Let's go to the master teacher. Don't take my word for it. Our elder brother and our way shower, Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Let's read it together. Everyone who hears these words and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And Jesus wanted to make it really clear what really happened here when he says at the end of that scripture together, and great was the fall of it. I resonate, I resonate with that. It may be honking. It may be angry. I'm late to an appointment because somebody stopped at a green light. It may be what somebody says. It may be a moment of forgetting, and all of a sudden, the great fall happens. Everything I talk about here, everything we share here, goes out and is set aside. I call this rubber meets the road spirituality, and it's the true church. Lots of people are meeting today in buildings, but the true church happens day to day with every step that you are taking. The true test of our spiritual duality. We teach, don't we teach? One presence. There is only one presence. There's only one power. And we teach about the divinity of all people. Look around the room. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God. Amen. The inherent goodness of all creation. And it must stand and be true and absolute in us when all hell is breaking loose. It is absolute in its nature and it does not change because we're uncomfortable. It does not change because we're angry. It does not change because an old thought comes up. It does not change. Spiritual principle is spiritual principle. It is law. It is to be used moment to moment to moment to moment to moment, even when you're in the traffic, even when you are upset. Oh, life is good, isn't it? Wonderful in the sanctuary of my peaceful bliss and the illusion. I'm reminded of that old silly adage, if the tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, I like to say that if the peace that I have is contained within the environment of only a sanctuary where people are of like mind, but it doesn't stand the test of time when you're out in the world, when you come up against somebody who thinks very differently than you, who votes very differently than you, who has a completely different perspective. The truth is the truth. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God. Say that with me. Everywhere I look, I see the face of God. That is absolute in its nature. It does not change, and we cannot give ourselves wiggle room. We cannot make exceptions to where we find the face of God. God. And we get to ask ourselves then, is my belief system founded on rock or on sand? Are my spiritual beliefs solidly engraved in my life or do they disappear like a handful of sawdust when they are not convenient? You see, the spiritual path and what we teach here is not about convenience. I'm not going to let you off the hook or myself. Viktor Frankl, um, you think, you, you know, we have our little problems and our challenges in life. And sometimes I call them hangnails. We're first world problems. But I like to go to the heroes whose shoulders we stand upon, who understood what real heartache and real pain was. In world War II, Viktor Frankl had everything taken from him, including his family and his life work. This is what he had to say. I invite you to read this with me. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. 
In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Choice is what I call grace, our ability to stay conscious and to choose our experience. So what is that space for you? What do all the great spiritual masters say happens in that space? Come on, all you yoga people. Breathe. Take a breath. Sometimes we think that Sabbath is only coming together on a Sunday morning. No, Sabbath is every moment you take a breath and go, I'm not defined by what's happening. I'm only defined by who I am. That breath is all that's needed to remember the truth that you are not and have never been separate from God. Say that with me, this, this phrase. I am not and never will be separate from God. Together, I am not and never will be separate from God. That was about the time it took to take one breath. A stimulus just happened. Let me respond from that consciousness. Let me respond from a higher truth. Let me respond, as Viktor Frankl did, from a higher vibration and a higher energy. A lot can happen in that breath. The talk title today is The Heart of the Moment. We're familiar with the term, the heat of the moment, right? Anybody ever experienced the heat of the moment? We've often heard that term, which we have used to get us into a heck of a lot of trouble. I may have a few true confessions today, but I want you to bring up into your mind and into your skin and into your thought process right now that moment when you acted from the heat of the moment and not the heart of the moment. The breath puts us down into the heart, but the heat, well, these are the moments when anger takes the wheel over spirit, when desire and passion takes the wheel away from spiritual integrity. The heart of the moment is when we take that breath between stimulus and response and we consciously reclaim the truth of our lives. We reclaim the truths that we celebrate in this room, but we do it out there as a great reminder. And we let spiritual truth take the driver's seat again. That's really easy to do, isn't it? <laughs> I got one yes. There's nothing easy about that. It is much easier to say than it is to do. We can talk a good game in here, but then we get out of the world and something happens and it's like, oh, I forgot, I forgot. All we do here on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, and every class is have a constant reminder to keep us awake, to keep us conscious, to keep us aware that spiritual truth does not change no matter where you happen to be. I can picture Jesus himself. Again, I like to go to the elder brother, the way shower, the master teacher in the wilderness. He's in the wilderness at one point. Another time he's talking to Peter who is just flapping his mouth. Peter had a way of doing that, flapping his mouth as a distraction. Anybody got distractions in your life that feel like Peter? His whole life was one big distraction after another, but what did he say more than one occasion? Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, we don't believe in a devil. There is no devil. There is no Satan. That's the uh, construct of the human mind. There is the human ego that's inside of us and outside of us. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. But he followed it up every single time with what? Let's put the, the scripture up there. I think I have it. Yep, let's read that last line together. It is God alone that is important. And I would say from the unity standpoint, it is God alone that is real. It is God alone that is absolute. By whatever name you want to give the God, it's the divine essence expressed as you, the point of power in the mind of the universe. That's all that matters. All the rest is trying to pull you off center. When you have your kids and they're misbehaving, you're saying, get thee behind me, Satan, any part of your mind and your heart that can't behold the face of God in the midst of that tantrum. Or when you're dealing with a difficult person at work, Get thee behind me any part of myself that has forgotten to see the face of God. Get thee behind me any energy that's existing within my heart and in my field that is missing God. If you have missed God, God is not missing. You have missed it. You're not looking deeply enough. The heart of the moment, the breath, take a breath with me and let it go, is the Sabbath that is necessary to return home to be the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter coming back to the place. It means that you are meeting life 
from the fire of an awareness of oneness with God. That's the fire I want to have cultivated, a fire that does not go out. It's a fire that is eternal. It is absolute. The fire of an unfettered, unfazed, and unshaken spirit and commitment to spiritual law. This situation will be what I make it. This relationship will be what I make it. I don't give you power. We said last week in that class, Jesus before Pilate said, you have no power. Any power you have comes from a higher place, a higher vibration from the mind that's here. And I don't give you any power. I claim it as my own, for the Father and I are one. The infinite spirit of life and I are one. A couple years back, I had a leadership class. And we asked ourselves some questions. When we talk about the fire of spirit, the fire of the holy awareness and consciousness, how do we know if we're on fire, if we're burning up? Anybody ever ask that question of yourself? It's a good question to ask. How do I know if this passion and this enthusiasm and this emotion is on fire or if I'm burning up? Here are some questions I, we had to ask in that class. I invite you to ask them as well. Do I respond to life or do I react to it? That's going to determine if you're burning up or if you're on fire. Am I feeling pulled by a vision or controlled by circumstances? Any given moment, you'll be on fire. The next moment, you might be burning up. But maybe those burning up moments are less and less and less and less as you remain steady and conscious to take the spiritual truths that we teach here out into the world. I'm going to start meddling. Am I motivated by values or am I motivated by desires? Big distinguishing difference. How you answer that is going to determine if you are grounded on rock or you're sinking in the sand. Am I motivated by spirit or by need? Am I motivated by being good or am I motivated by feeling good? Think that, being good. It's going to determine whether you're on fire or you're burning up, plain and simple. But I'm going to continue to meddle. This is where new thought tends to come in sometimes, and I think we miss the boat. Am I living as the presence of God, or am I using God as a tool to improve my earthly existence? There's a lot of movies out there that brought new thought to the forefront, and they were great to bring it to the forefront, but it was all about using the energy that's been placed into our hands, the ability to manifest through our thoughts and our feelings, all about making life better. So I'm asking you today, are you being the way of God or are you in the way of God? Are you being God or are you simply using the energy, the gift that's been given to you to make a better world, to get a car, to get the better house, to have the better relationship? Those are effects. Those are effects that come from you vibrating as the awareness that I am the presence of God. I am the point of power in the mind of God. But we put the effects before the cause. We are students of cause. We must be the cause. And so I invite you to say with me, I am the cause. I, I'm not there yet. I want to hear it again. I am. Now I'm going to add to it. I am the cause of my own reality. I am the cause of my own reality. Reality. I am the veritable name of God. When you speak those words, I am, whatever you put after it is following you. Whatever follows I am is following you. So I'm saying maybe the question we need to ask to determine if we're burning up or on fire is, is let's put those questions up. Did we have it? Right there. Together. How do I turn I want, I need, and I desire into I am? This is what unity gives me, the great gift. I need for nothing. I want for nothing. I desire for nothing because I have it already in my field. It's already in my mind and in my heart. I'm living as a veritable presence of God in the now moment. The minute we say, I need, we've put that good away from us. The minute we say, I want, I've put that which I'm seeking away from me. Or I desire, I am that which I am seeking. I am that feeling and that expression and that relationship that I have with myself first before it shows up in the world of effects. This is an important question to ask. We walk through this, this life. You ever notice that we walk through conscious, unconscious, conscious, unconscious, awake, 
and to sleep. It happens as part of the human journey. But it's depending on what part of our system is operating at any given moment. We are multi-dimensional re realities. We are multi-dimensional beings. It says in Scripture, in my Father's house are many rooms, many dimensions, many vibrations. And for too long, people have said, well, that's all out here. There's, there's layers of reincarnation, of heaven and hell, all kinds of different rooms. That's a great scapegoat to accept responsibility that within the kingdom of heaven, which he told us was within, there are many levels within us. You have four operating systems that have been great gifts to you in order to traverse this earth experience. What are those four bodies or those four operating systems? Anybody call them out. Your mind. There's a mental body. The spiritual body. What else do we have? Physical body. It's a gift of God. Some of the gifts are a little bit nicer than other gifts, but <laughs> and, uh, you have a physical, a mental, emotional, and a spiritual body. And they must be in an integrated whole. They must be firing on all cylinders in order for us to have the heaven on earth experience that we want to manifest. Yes? How many times have we just spiritualized something and said, well, the only one that really matters is the spiritual body? Well, get, you're in a physical body. If you quit caring about your physical body, that gift that God gave you, then you're going to be in trouble. If we operate only from the physical, we're going to be in big trouble. If you operate only from a mental capacity and make your decisions based only on what is happening mentally, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be a house that's burning down, a house that's built on sand. All systems, all pistons must be firing all together. Heat without heart is unconscious destruction. Heat in any one of those four bodies is going to cause some problems on our earthly existence. You see, when the mental or physical system is operating unconsciously, anybody ever been there? Without the other two, you burn up, you burn down, and you burn out. Heat without heart is destruction. How about the heart operating as a solo entity? Anybody ever have your heart just operate, your, your emotional body? And you make a decision based upon an emotion, only to find out 10 days later that the, that the emotions weren't correct, that they weren't founded in truth. I always like to say, follow your heart, but for God's sake, take your brain. <laughs> for Pete's sake, take your brain. They are partners. They are sisters. They are necessary. What is important is that the heart is used as a connecting point between all of the four bodies. Think of a tree. Think of a tree. I liken the leaves to the physical body, the branches to the mental body, and the trunk as the emotional body. But where is the juice? Where do you know if a tree is healthy or not? Jesus said it, in the root. In the root. It can look bad on the outside, but if you tend to the roots, it will get healthy on the, on the outside. Tend what's going on on the inside. But the trunk is the emotional body. And I'm going to call that the heart of the matter. It's, the, it's, it's sending energy in different quadrants to the leaves, to the branches, to the roots. It's a great communication system. I'm going to call the heart of the matter your soul. Your soul that is integrating a great web of energy being shared between spirit, spiritual realms, physical realms, mental realms, and emotional realms. All systems firing as one, communi communicating and cooperating. You and your soul is the trunk of the tree. Ever make a decision based solely on the body's needs? I carry with me today a pain from fourth grade. I was a very tiny kid. I weighed next to nothing. A strong wind could have blown me over. Very short, very small. Anybody who's ever been small knows that that meant I had a big target on my back for all the bullies. There is a target. Oh, let's go after the little guy. And I got picked on a lot as a kid. And something happened one day where the only system that was operating was the physical system. And we happened to be playing baseball. And I grabbed a bat and I broke the arm of the bully. He didn't pick on me anymore. <laughs> but let me tell you, the wounds of his broken arm were nothing compared to the wounds that I carry to this day that I had to discover I had the capacity to just physically act out like that and go out of control. My spiritual journey began the moment in fourth grade when I said, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to live like that. 
but that energy still is within me. I'm a very competitive guy, and I realize I have to manage that physical body in partnership with the other bodies. How about your mental body? Anybody ever lash out? Didn't have a bat in your hand. Well, a few years later, into my 20s, the monster rose again. Now, I had to hug the monster. I had a boss who was a very, very close friend. And I was working for her, and the environment was really not a conducive environment to, to well-being. There was not a lot of spirituality in that environment, even though it was a church. And I just let loose one day to my very close friend, not with a bat, but with words and anger and hate and all kinds of resentment that had been built up over time. I let loose on her. And it is true that uh, sometimes the wounds of the heart go deeper. I lost a friendship because I was out of control simply from a mental place. Oh, I had the physical body under control, but boy, my competitive nature came out and I let her have it between the eyes. Whether she deserved it or not, nobody deserves it, really. She got it. And there are more than, there's more than one person that carries the wounds of that unbalanced environment today. What about decisions with no connection to anything except emotional need? There were times, I'm sure all of us, where we just wanted to feel good. I just want to feel good because I don't love myself. I don't accept myself. I don't have a spiritual grounding to know that I am the veritable presence of God. I am a child of God, beautiful, whole, and, 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 and secure without the validation from the outside. And so we make decisions from an emotional place. Give me, as a hungry ghost, what I need. Validate me. And a decision made from that place is very, very dangerous. Many a marriage got destroyed over that unbalanced sort of culture inside. The heart is a beautiful gift. But the heart of the moment, the soul, is where there needs to be that integration. Love and strength are sisters, are brothers. Love and power must be in the same field. The body, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual body must be an integrated whole or we are burning up. So I'm asking you to take some reflection today, to take some inventory today. Where are you firing on all cylinders and where are you out of, of congruity with what we've talked about today? And I don't mean in here. You can put on a good face in here. I'm talking about out there. When you're leaning on the horn and wanting to flash the Hawaiian good luck sign in one form or another. D.L. Moody, I'm going to bring the band back up. D.L. Moody once wrote this. I'm going to invite you to say it with me. I have never known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. It's really easy to see that in the world, to have the eyes to look out here Oh, yeah, the world's divided. The religious don't get along. 6,000 different Christian sects, 4,000 different Buddhist sects. It's really easy. I'm saying make it personal. Make it real personal. A house divided against itself will fall. Say that with me. A house divided against itself will fall. A life divided against itself will fall fall. Your body and your mind and your heart and your spirit are all valuable tools and gifts that must be implemented. So I'm asking you to take inventory today. If you want to know if you're burning up or on fire, look at all four of those quadrants and find out where it is working. Our work, a little music maestro, work as a spiritual student looking to be more conscious in our approach is about using the heart center not as a sole proprietor but as the nucleus of integration. Take your hand and place it upon your, your, wherever you find your soul, wherever your soul resides within you, wherever you feel it and know it. Say after me, this is a nucleus of integration. This is a nucleus of integration. This is the hub of equanimity and balance and harmony that creates a life that's on fire and not burning up. Our work is to build a house on that rock. So when we find ourselves in the proverbial wilderness for 40 days or Peter yammering in our ears or somebody stopped at the green light and you're late for your appointment and you're leaning on the horn, you can say, get thee behind me. 
any part of myself that does not belong in this equation. When Satan is tempting you to go one direction or the other, when the ego is pulling you to say one body is more important than the other, beware, Will Robinson, beware. We can easily say, get thee behind me. Our work is to be on fire as an integrated whole and not burning up as the next victim of circumstances. To not be the next victim of what's happening out here, but to be the veritable master of what's happening on the inside on rock. And so this week, when you feel you want to flash the Hawaiian good luck sign, stop between stimulus and response. Take a breath with me. That's the Sabbath I'm calling for, the great remembrance of who you are. Let's stay in that place as we go into meditation with the words peace, peace, peace. Peace resides in the moment. Peace resides within you. Peace resides within the awareness that you are not alone and that you are a gift, that your body, your mind, your heart, and your spirit are gifts of God all working together. We know that not just for ourselves right now, but for the whole world. Please sing these songs with Danny Owl.